Welcome back to the Sense Making series. This film is going to be about conspiracy and spirituality, but really it's kind of about the balance between certainty and uncertainty and the dance between them, which I think is core to sense making. So I'm going to unpack what for me feels like quite a new phenomenon, or at least has really ramped up massively since the beginning of the pandemic. And that's this sort of mashup between conspiracy communities and spiritual communities, which a lot of other people have also commented on. So we're going to hear from friends of the channel like Jamie Wheel and some other new voices. So I'm going to be looking back at some of the really big moments over the last couple of months, including the runaway success of the pandemic trailer, which was kind of everywhere a couple of months ago and has got a really, really interesting backstory. And also I'm going to talk a little bit about the David Icke interviews on London Real, which we might have covered a couple of times before on this channel as well. And want to give a disclaimer right at the beginning that it's very tricky to talk about conspiracy at all. And we're really, I'm really looking at it through the focus of sense making. I'm not looking at the truth content or otherwise, or most of the kind of conspiracy narratives. If that's what you're interested in, there's plenty of other places you can get that from. But I'm also trying to fill a little bit of a gap because I feel like the traditional media or the mainstream media has a bit of a blind spot around a lot of these topics because they don't really, they've got a very sort of secular and rationalist bias, so don't really understand spirituality. So first, I'm going to unpack what I think is quite a new phenomenon. So everyone's kind of familiar with the old school Infowars, Alex Jones, kind of conspiracy as entertainment, raging against the globalists. I don't like them putting chemicals in the water that turn the friggin' frogs gay! But both the David Icke interview and the pandemic film are kind of different. They come from a different place. So in the David Icke interview on London Real, we had sort of veering between the conscious and spiritual. When we realize the true nature of what we are, which is consciousness, eternal, exploring, forever consciousness, having a brief experience called human. To the kind of really dark and paranoid. I have tracked this, these people, this cult, for 30 years full time. And I've seen their staggering, shocking levels of psychopathy. And the backstory for the film Plandemic is really interesting as well, because the director, Mickey Willis, used to make films about kind of spiritual concepts like The Secret. And then the film Plandemic took a very different tone. Because if we don't stop this now, we can not only forget our republic and our freedom, but we can forget humanity because we'll be killed by this agenda. And an analysis after Plandemic was released showed that it spread equally through kind of what you might have assumed was kind of quite left wing, natural health, new age circles, and then quite right wing, QAnon, conspiratorial circles. And the movie spread like wildfire through the spiritual community which I think is a phenomenon that's really worth unpacking. Not looking at the content of the films, not looking at the content of the interviews, but what we're seeing is a wider phenomenon. And I don't think you can really do this without understanding some of the nature of spirituality and some of the nature of like, genuine spiritual awakening. Uh, and I think the problem that we get with the mainstream when they kind of look at this stuff and they debunk it or they kind of just assume it's bogus is that they don't really have a frame of reference because they don't really understand spirituality. And that's what I really want to unpack in this film. And I think it can only really be explained when we understand what genuine spiritual awakening means and how that process can also become uh, very difficult to navigate, very difficult to make sense of. And I caught up with a friend of the channel, Jamie Wheel, who wrote the book Stealing Fire which was probably the, the best guide to transformational culture and awakening that's come out. And he had a really interesting take on it. So anything that creates a boundary dissolving, self eroding, narrative collapsing, lived experience is then prone to, well, now that's all been blown to smithereens. What do I repopulate it with? So a lot of people go from, oh, I was all up in my head. I was chasing you know, the nine to five and a gold watch or my 401k, I realized that was just a, all a fucking illusion. So now I believe in aliens and angels and my ability to manifest stuff. And oh, by the way, if that's true, then maybe vaccines aren't true. Maybe the WHO, maybe Bill Gates, maybe, maybe, maybe. And you end up kind of just going through the floorboards of logical, consistent sense-making into um, if what I've been sold to start with was a bill of goods, I am now credibly willing to believe damn near anything 
as a replacement versus realizing that reconstructing a more complex, subtle, nuanced post-conventional reality is actually 10 times more work. So I'm gonna start by saying, I know it's really difficult to talk about conspiracy theory full stop. It's what is often called an overloaded term in that it refers to a lot of different things. And it can often be used to dismiss anything that's not a mainstream narrative. Um, and I think I'd be interested actually uh, if people can come up with some ways of differentiating because it feels very different to me. Like alternative histories, corruption, collusion, conspiracy. And a really good example of that was the recent interview with Tom O'Neill on the Joe Rogan experience, looking at the Manson killings, looking at the JFK assassination and building a really compelling and really interesting uh, alternative history that seems like for me really rings true. It really, it really seems to explain a lot of what was going on in the 60s. Um, but then there's a qualitative difference, like something that feels very different. And that's an all encompassing explanation for the world. And where people attach a real sort of deep level of certainty to it as well. And I was kind of, I, I've not been able to really find anyone who's been able to identify the difference between those two things, but they feel very qualitatively different. A friend of mine, Ivind, actually put up something recently, I think came closest to explaining what the difference was. And he talked about it in terms of archetypes. He's, he's got a, a background with the psychologist Jung and looks at Jung's way of uh, understanding the world, which is archetypes and the sort of mythical dimension. And he said that what the, the difference is when we're in relationship to reality or when we're in relationship to something that feels like an archetypal force, where all of the power and all the agency is outside oneself rather than uh, it being us feeling that we have power and we have agency. And there's a real difference between that and being aware of when we're in relationship to something that feels that it has all of the power and we have none. We need to be really careful because that's obviously a very disempowering place to be. And there's almost, a, if we feel that we're in relationship to something like that, it almost has an archetypal dimension or a religious dimension to it. I've seen that there is, there is a tendency for people that plunge too far into this narrative or this alternative sense-making paradigm is that they start slipping from reality bit by bit and they sort of fall into these dark, all-encompassing dreamscapes that feel almost trance-like. So this channel is mostly a focus on how we make sense of the world, sense-making, the crisis in sense-making, because that seems to be the the main problem right now, how we find truth together in this very uncertain time, very uncertain world. And I think one of the things is, is a realization that we have to be really aware of ourselves, of our inner world, of how we're attaching and how we're attaching more certainty, for example, to things than the inputs or the evidence would warrant, uh, which is something that Daniel Schmachtenberger talked about in the War on Sensemaking film we put out. How do I make sense of what is true and what isn't true? about signal coming in, and then how do I parse from lots of signal what might be true about reality? Almost no one who has fervent ideas has a good epistemic basis for the level of certainty they hold. There's a decoupling between how much certainty they have and how much certainty they should have through right process. So I'm specifically talking about these all-encompassing conspiracy theories here, uh, which is why I'm gonna talk about David Icke, because David Icke really epitomizes that, the level of certainty that he brings for example, in the London Real interview where he's talking about the virus as a hoax. And this uh, COVID-19 scam hoax has been designed to um, create in very fast time the very global centralization of power that, um, that we have uh, or I have been um, highlighting for 30 years was coming. And I also think that there's a reason why a lot of these explanations are really resonating with people is because I think a lot of them are largely picking up on a right intuition about the world. I think we're in a, as we've said in many of the other films, we're in a system that is failing massively, that is really out on many levels. And I think what a lot of these conspiracy theories do is they collapse what should be an ongoing inquiry process into what's really going on into a concrete uh, narrative. Good guys, bad guys, and what becomes kind of an ideology. And that I want to really unpack, like what, what do they get right and what do they get wrong, which I'll come back to at the end of the film.
Why I'm so interested in this topic, why I'm so passionate about it, is I think that as a culture, we're going to have to start really grappling with what it means to have a spiritual experience. Uh, because more and more people are having them. In some of the latest surveys, they found that more than 50% of people have had some kind of religious or spiritual experience. So understanding what the benefits are, what the pitfalls are, is hugely important. And also the psychologist Stanislav Grof talked about psychedelics and other uh, experiences as being non-specific amplifiers, that they basically made everything in our, in our world, in our lives, more intense. And what we're going through right now with the pandemic is kind of a non-specific amplifier. Like it's making everything much more intense for all of us. We're all focused on the same thing. And I think we're going to have to understand, we're going to have to really integrate this understanding of spiritual experience and also the concept of spiritual emergency, which is another concept of Stan Groff's. And a friend of mine, Jules Evans and Tim Reed, have just brought out a book uh, about spiritual emergency. And we're going to hear from them a little bit later on. So I'm going to talk about David Icke because I think it's a perfect example of a genuine spiritual experience and then what can happen if we try and make sense of it prematurely. He's seen as a fringe figure by many people, but the first thing to note is that David Icke is actually really, really popular. His interviews on London Real before the pandemic were some of the most popular films they'd ever put out. And he talks to huge audiences all around the UK and around the world. David Icke. So he famously declared himself the son of God on the chat show Wogan in 1991 and declared that the world was going to end that year. I'm saying that these things are going to happen this year, then we'll see, won't we? And what'll happen if they don't happen? What'll happen to you? They will happen because if they don't happen, there will be no Earth. And it is, it's as simple as that. And I frankly don't care what anyone thinks. They have free will to make their own choices on what is said. I say wait and see. Now, personally, I now look back and I think it's a very ethically dubious decision to invite him onto that show in the middle of an experience like that. It obviously made him a laughing stock and uh, he now talks about how it's pretty much all anyone remembers about him. Let me get the story right. The press claim that you claim to be the son of God. Mm -hmm. Is that true? Yes, you see, the thing is that uh, see, it's, quite, it's quite funny, really. You know, 2,000 years ago, had a guy called Jesus sat here and said these same things, you would still be laughing. It's really, really funny that we've not really moved on that much. And I've not shared this publicly before, but I've had similar experiences of what I would call spiritual emergency, where it feels like you're at the center of this kind of huge drama, this huge cosmic drama, and it all feels focused on you. And I think that's something that we're all capable of, that we can all go into at different times. Uh, and it's really hard to keep grounded in the middle of that kind of experience. I was actually looking at making a documentary about exactly this topic, the relationship between spirituality, mental health. Uh, I called it learning to swim. And the reason it was called that is from a, a quote by Joseph Campbell, where he said that the mystic swims in the same water that the psychotic drowns. And I think that's a really important realization or insight. So when I went through that experience, it was a hugely intense time. I was lucky enough to have friends and colleagues who helped me out. Um, but people at work knew about it. And still to this day, I'm kind of embarrassed that people at work know that I kind of lost it uh, for a bit. And to know that a lot of people I respect, a lot of people I work with kind of know this about me. I have no idea what it might be like for someone to go on a national chat show during one of those experiences and then for that to be the main thing that people remember about them. This is also a really difficult thing to talk about because you also don't want to end up saying that all mental health crises are spiritual emergencies because that's also an oversimplification. You've got to be really careful. Um, and like people have experiences, some people need to be on, on drugs to stabilize them, others don't. Uh, so I thought the, the, the best way to talk about this with kind of responsibility would be to talk to Tim Reed. So Tim Reed is a psychiatrist. He's worked at the sharp end of mental health in the UK for about 20 years. But he was also studying with Stan Groff, uh, training as a holotropic breath worker and really looking into spiritual emergencies. And he's just brought out this book with Jules Evans about spiritual emergency. So I thought he would be the best person to speak to about the nature of these experiences and how he's helped people through them in the past. 
as as we go into the deeper parts of the psyche, we might feel um, a combination of, of 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 spiritual awakening, if you like, but also feel drawn into a, a closer encounter with with, with 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 aspects of our shadow. By shadow, we generally mean those parts of ourselves, um, our individual psyche, maybe even our collective psyche that we're not aware of, that we're, we're blind to, that we can't, we can't really see or hear. Um, the parts of the psyche that have maybe been, been very wounded um, in our development and we've constructed often quite elaborate psychological defences around them. So when we get to these parts of our psyche, we not only come in contact with some of the, the pain that we hold in these wounds, often the shame, um, but we also also come into contact with the, the defensive structures that we've, we've built around them. So in any, in any deep inner state, um, it's really important to, to look inside and to try to figure out something about these wounds, the pain, the difficult emotional space, that, that, that we, that we feel around it and the defenses. So it's a, it's a real, it's a real, it's a real journey inwards. Um, sometimes people don't take the attention inwards, but they project everything onto the, out, onto the outside world. Um, there's a term for that, which is often used called a, a confusion of levels. Um, that essentially what is an inner experience that should be taken mostly symbolically is then projected onto the outside world so that everything is seen out there rather than, rather than in, in here. But after such experiences, people, uh, people feel as though they're, um, they're, they're very vulnerable. Their, their ego structures, if you like, have been cracked right open. Um, and it, in a way, they can be likened to um, an, an infant state, an, a newborn baby. It's, they, they need very gentle holding, very gentle space. Uh, while while they regather themselves, make sense of their experience, and emerge from it, um, and if that doesn't happen, um, if if people re-engage with ordinary, everyday, noisy, smelly, dirty reality too too quickly, it can be absolutely brutalizing. And this this is very often where we we um, we, we see people running into problems. So coming back to David Icke, my sense is that he had a genuine spiritual experience, but the decision to bring him onto Wogan in the middle of that meant that it couldn't really complete in a natural way. And as he says, turned him into a laughing stock. <laughs> but just let, just let me, just let me say this. They're laughing at you. They're not laughing with you. Fine. And I think it's fair to say that he's still deeply affected by that experience. I've been saying this for so long. Oh, you're mad. That David Icke's mad. Oh, yeah, okay. You're not laughing now, are you? So as I said earlier, I think that a lot of these conspiracy theories have uh, traction because they're picking up on a right intuition. And I think that's a really interesting frame. And I think a lot of the conspiracy narratives are picking up that we're in a deeply corrupt, sick, and failing system. But what they do is collapse around a certain narrative rather than keeping it as an open inquiry into what's really going on. And I think we've touched on a lot of these topics in, in previous films. Eric Weinstein talking about kind of institutional decay. We have effectively entered a period in which we cannot trust our experts. We've got two generations of institutional experts that are corrupted and that we cannot wake up from this crazy fever dream that we're all in because we can't figure out who we can still trust. The doctors are compromised, the professors are compromised, the journalists are compromised, the politicians are compromised. About the only thing that isn't badly compromised are people with an independent source of sustenance. Daniel Schmachtenberg are talking about self-terminating systems. Rival risk dynamics multiplied by exponential tech self-terminate. Exponential tech is inexorable. We cannot put it away. So we either figure out anti-rivalry or we go extinct. The human experiment comes to a completion. And that's not to say that there are not actual conspiracies out there. We've also put out films about the Epstein case. Uh, the Epstein case, as you'll, you'll see if you have a look at that one with, with Eric Weinstein, looks to me like there's a lot more than we've been told and it could kind of link into security services and some kind of large structure, as Eric talks about. The really difficult part of the story, David, is, is that almost certainly we're talking about some kind of operation that was being run with knowledge of governments that may have involved pedophilia and was not shut down. 
And in a way, I think it's almost impossible to go through this experience of questioning our given reality and not pop into uh, some kind of questioning of the entire consensus reality. But it's really important not to get stuck in those fixed narratives on the other side. We've talked on the channel about the key things that we need to learn to deal with this shift that we're all going through is discernment and improving our sense making, really improving uh, the way that we make sense of the world. So it's interesting to look at Plandemic through this lens as well and the director, Mickey Willis. So Mickey Willis's company is called Elevate Films and he used to make sort of spiritually inspiring content, uh, including a film about the secret the secret being about kind of manifestation and that if you set your visualizations, the world will kind of align itself towards you. And I'd also have put him sort of firmly on the left of the political spectrum, on the woke side. Uh, he had this very famous viral hit where he took his son to the toy store and got him a doll. Azai here had a birthday recently and he received two presents that were exactly the same. So I said, let's go to the toy store and we'll exchange one for something that you don't have. And this is what he chose. <laughs> now, how do you think a dad feels when his son wants to get this? Yeah! 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 You say, yeah, choose it. Choose your expression, choose what you're into, choose your sexuality, choose whatever, and you have my promise right now, both of you, to love you and accept you no matter what life you choose. <laughs> And actually, Jamie Wheel, who we heard from earlier in the film, also knows Mickey from before. Interestingly, um, the film Plandemic, which actually came from folks who are familiar with Elevate Films and Mickey Willis, um, in the last year or so, he has taken a, an, an abrupt, a very noticeable, uh, more conspiratorial and kind of right-leaning turn, where he used to be in the kind of conchy new age space and very, you know, doing documentaries on ayahuasca i think earlier doing something about the secret so very much kind of new thought positivity and kind of pro-social in fact i think he had another viral video where he was in the car with his son you know talking about hey it's okay for my son to play with a little mermaid doll so very much on the kind of you know secular progressive left more or less with this new film that he's come out with which is anti-vax you know elevating a lot of those old stories dusting them off and repackaging them into the corona you know milieu um the propagation of that was overwhelmingly far right so the, the center of the word cloud cluster for the network map of how that went it was QAnon, and then a whole lot of kind of bright body and other things so so what is going on there and whether that was deliberate and intentional and that was a specific pre-launch campaign for it to support it going viral or whether that was just mimetic stickiness and for whom did that bell toll, you know, and, and retweet and prompt retweets? I don't know. Um, but I do know that, you know, Mickey did not fall off the media turnip truck yesterday. Um, so, so were there some intentional um, track laying ahead of time? It would make sense. I mean, anytime you invest in a project, you want people to see it. But for sure, it caught. But then Plandemic was a very different tone and a very different film. I won't go too much into the content in it, but as a filmmaker, I found that it had, it was a kind of hodgepodge of lots of different conspiracy theories. It wasn't really a single narrative, which I think helped it go viral. So it was taken up by people on the left who are kind of concerned about vaccines and concerned about natural health. And it was also taken up by people on the right who are concerned about Gates and concerned about Fauci. And as the, the map of the spread of it showed, it really took off in both of those areas from QAnon all the way to natural news and natural health. And that in itself is a really fascinating phenomenon that we're seeing these two things coming together. Um, and I think the best frame that I have for understanding it is something that my friend Jules Evans said recently. So Jules brought out the book on spiritual emergency with Tim Reed and was talked about how these two things, like the secret, this sort of the universe is aligned, everything is kind of as I, as I intend and the universe will conspire to help me. And the alternative of there are these powers uh, there are these conspiracies that have all the agency and I have none, that these things can flip together very easily. One is a kind of positive conspiracy, which you could um, define by a kind of sort of mystical experience, like everything is connected. I am connected to, to everything in the universe, and that's wonderful. The universe's mission is flowing through me. I am naturally attracting helpers 
to to kind of bring this new age, this glorious new age for humanity into existence. Um, so you see lots of people in the occult in this kind of ecstatic globalism, I, I call it. People like um, H.G. Wells or like theosophists or, um, you know, in, in the in the new age movement in the seventies and eighties, there was a book by Marilyn Ferguson called the Aquarian conspiracy. Uh, HG Wells wrote a book called the open conspiracy. And these were like ecstatic networked globalist, progressive free love um, people. And they're like, this is happening. An age of love is happening. It's happening through us. We are the, we are the kind of vanguard. We are the elite. Okay. So that's one, what I call the positive conspiracy. And then there's the negative conspiracy, which kind of grew up in reaction to that. And the negative, it's kind of like the bad trip version of that good trip. And it's like everything is connected. Um, there's an elite controlling everything, but I'm not included. Uh, I'm an outsider to it. So instead, everything is connected and controlled by some shadowy elite uh, of self-appointed kind of masters uh, and, 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 and they're all kind of networked together in their own like think tanks and organizations and they're controlling everything and they must be stopped. So David Icke for me is a real example of a kind of arrested development. And my experience and making sense of what happened to me is that we have these really huge spiritual experiences that our egos, our sort of small personalities try and grab onto and make it personal, make it about us believe that we have a unique level of consciousness, that we have a unique ability, that we are special, as David Icke said in the interview on London Real. I am more powerful than they are, and they frickin' know it. I ain't come here to fail, and I frickin' won't. Why are you more powerful than they are, David? Why? because I have levels of consciousness and everybody watching this program has those same levels of consciousness if they will only open their minds to it. And this is what the psychologist Carl Jung warned specifically about if we're going to go into these realms, is confusing ourselves, our egos, with what he called the self with a capital S, the collective unconscious, the archetypes, that which is much vaster than we are, that we can have glimpses of and be inspired by, but never confuse ourselves with. Because what comes up in that elevated state, and especially afterwards, is all of the stuff that we haven't dealt with. As we talked about, the non-specific amplifier amplifies all of those other parts of our personalities and narcissism and need for approval. All of that comes up and then has to be dealt with. And if we don't deal with it, it will take us down at some point. And one of the other things to be really careful of is instead of integrating and realizing our own shadow, as Jordan Peterson so beautifully talked about, the roots of the shadow go all the way down to hell and we really need to confront it in ourselves before we try and tackle it out in the world. Jung didn't believe that you could be a good person until you realized your capacity for evil. I don't mean acted it out in the world. But understand that it's possible. It's a horrible thing to realize that you're human and what being human means. Like angel, like Christ to Satan, that's the human being. And that requires honesty, that requires time, that requires doing the work in relationship with others and really looking at ourselves. And the danger if we don't do that is that we project all of the stuff that we haven't looked at and we haven't examined out onto the world, as Tim Reed talks about. It's just really important to do your own deep inner work in a meaningful way. So you, you really engage with, with shadow. Uh, and again, shadow being various parts of yourself that you don't really want to think of, think about, the, the deep wounds, the defences you put up uh, against them. Um, and if you don't if you don't engage with shadow, this this tends to be the result um, that shadow tends to be projected um, on, onto the external environment, which can then become threatening. And the other thing that I would suggest is that these all-encompassing conspiracy narratives are essentially religious in structure. At the heart of it, it's very Christian. There is a community of the elect, there is a community of the damned, there are the evil ones, there are the saved. And even though at some times they seem really dark, they're actually rapture ideologies, they're utopian. Because if only we could expose this group, particular group of people, whoever they are, 
then humanity would be free and utopia would be at hand. All I can say to that is, if only it was that simple. That's all I got. See you soon. Rebel Wisdom was set up to make sense of the world at a deeper level than the mainstream media. It was built for these times of crisis and change, which is why we want to do what we can to meet the challenge of the times. More films, and also for our Rebel Wisdom members, weekly sense-making calls with our amazing interviewees. And also, we're introducing the Wisdom Gym, a place to practice some of the skills that we've talked about on the channel. Thanks for watching. See you soon.